Hello, it's a pleasure to be here at the Lonti channel. Today we will speak about integrability, ADS safety correspondence, and we will also look into Mathematica. So the purpose of this lecture is threefold. First, we will learn about integrability use an example of uh, the simplest integrable spin chain. And as you know, integrability is currently used uh, everywhere uh, from condensed matter to quantum field theory, including in high dimensions. Uh, second, we will also learn a little bit about Mathematica, I hope. Now you'll find some examples uh, helpful for you, for your own research. And third, we'll also learn a little bit how to understand better a Russian accent. So the plan for today's lecture is the following. So the main, uh, main part will be uh, focused on the Heisenberg spin chain. We'll discuss main uh, techniques of solving it, uh, starting from coordinate bit ansatz, then discuss integrability construction based, uh, based on Jan Baxter equation, which will lead us naturally to algebraic bit ansatz. Uh, and uh, we'll then discuss at the end some examples of particular class of uh, solutions or states of this spin chain and the limit when the lens uh, goes to infinity. So this will be particularly important uh, for the ads safety applications, which uh, we'll briefly mention in the second part, uh, the connection first between the spin chains and n equals 4. Superang Mills, and then we will also try uh, to match the predictions of integrability with the string theory. In the course of this lecture, uh, in order to go through the calculations uh, faster, I will be demonstrating some Mathematica code. Uh, in case you are just starting with Mathematica, uh, there will be a supplementary video uh, to help you with some uh, basic uh, exercises in addition to the main set of exercises which will accomplish this lecture. All right, so what is a Heisenberg spin chain? So Heisenberg spin chain acts uh, on a Hilbert space of a sequence of spins, up, down, down, up, whatever you like. Uh, so Hilbert space, uh, will contain all possible combinations of this kind. So we will also can encode it with just a sequence of numbers 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. And then on this Hilbert space, we define the action by a Hamiltonian in the following way. So it's just some constant in front. And if I introduce the length of the chain to be L, then I will be summing from one to L, identity operator minus the permutation operator, which acts on two sides. So permutation operator is more or less obvious from the name. What it does, it takes your state, the pure state, um, which has a up at the position i and down at the position i plus one and transforms it so that these two spins are interchanged. Yeah. What else? So, of course, I mean, we have also to clarify a little bit uh, better what it means uh, when i is l. So, there are some options. Uh, and the one can consider periodic boundary conditions. And in this case, I just define it this way. But other boundary conditions are also important. Maybe we'll introduce them later. So now let's look at the uh, spectrum of this operator. As, as always in a quantum system, what we want to find is a uh, spectrum of eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. Um, so one of the states, which is quite obviously an eigenstate, is say when all spins are up, right? In this case, there is no difference between the permutation operator and the identity, and you just get zero, right? So this is the 
ground state, and we will refer to this state as omic. All right, actually, it's not the only ground state, right? You can also say <coughs> there is this state when all spins are down, and this is also annihilated by the Hamiltonian. Uh, so you can also use this as a vacuum if you like, but we will denote by omega uh, conventionally when all spins are up. Okay, so this one is a bit obvious one. Now, uh, more complicated is the case when there is one spin which is uh, flipped. So, for example, if I have something like up, up, down, up, up, <clears throat> then action of the identity wouldn't change anything. And permutation, actually, there are two terms in this sum which will give non zero result is when i is what two or i is three. So, and in this case, permutation will uh, mix us with two other possibilities, right? So, we'll get a sum of up, down, up, 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 or up, 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 down, up, and also identity will uh, keep the initial state where it was. So, obviously, uh, this state itself is not an eigenstate because Hamiltonian moves uh, this excitation or also known as magnon around the chain. And so it is not an eigenstate. So what happens, we have to use our intuition here. So we should think about this excitation as being a some type of quasi particle. And what is uh, good about quasi particles is that they can travel through the chain with some momentum. So it's natural guess for any like uh, physicist is to introduce some wave function, which is a linear combination of those states with one magnet at a fixed position with some momentum uh, factor, some phase factor, such that the spin down sits at this position. So we will see uh, this uh, uh, in Mathematica, but you can also do it by hand, it just takes too much time. Um, is that the eigenvalue is quite simple, it's just equal to, I think, something like some constant, and then uh, 1 minus cosine p. All right, so we will verify this later. So next step, next step is to consider something more complicated, the case of two excitations or two magnets. All right, so now uh, we already know something about uh, how it works for one magnet. So we can use again some physical uh, picture. So we can say that one magnet state correspond to this excitation moving with a momentum P. And then another magnet, if we want to consider the case of two magnets, we can similarly say is a particle moving with momentum Q. So how does this uh, translate into the wave function? So in a similar way, like before, now we have a sum over two possible positions of magnets and one and also n2 and to avoid double counting that uh, say the second magnet is to the right and the left one and then i have first magnet moving with momentum p second magnet moving with momentum q and then i have to multiply this by the basic uh, pure state with and one and two at these two positions we have two magnets so however because we are in interacting theory we have to add another contribution which would account for the fact that 
uh, when particle uh, go through each other, they can acquire an additional uh, phase factor. And this phase factor is nothing but a, uh, an S matrix in, in this um, system. Right, so we get uh, the following two terms. The first term correspond to the initial process. And then after the scattering uh, is taking place, uh, we add this factor. So now the question is, uh, of course, how to find this S of PQ. And of course, we just need to require that H Psi is the, the Psi eigen vector of H. And we will check again in uh, Mathematica that the result, so this is the result you should find uh, if you plug this and that into this equation, and this is uh, what goes under the name uh, coordinate between that. Now let us recall what was the initial problem we were solving. We were trying to find the spectrum of the Hamiltonian, and uh, since our high, uh, Hilbert space is finite dimension of Hamiltonian, is just a 2 to the L times 2 to the L matrix, right? 2 to the L times 2 to the L metric and so we expect to find uh, two to the L eigen uh, states and so far we have this parameter p say in the state with one magnum which is uh, continuous so the question is how do we get a discrete spectrum in the case of one magnum the answer is very simple you just have to require that uh, your wave function is uh, periodic in space so in other words if you take your magnum and move it around the whole uh, circle of length L, number of sides, then you should uh, come back to the initial wave function. So you have to require the periodicity condition that uh, for two magnets it's just a little bit harder. Now we have two particles and we have to take one of these particles and move it all the way around. So that's a particle with momentum P. So each time uh, we move by a certain distance uh, along the spin chain, uh, we get the uh, factor due to the free motion. But then each time we cross uh, another particle, we have to take into account uh, an extra phase factor S. So the periodicity condition in this case will be E to the I P L times S of P Q equals one. And similarly for another particle, for another magnum, we we'll write another condition. Um, this is Q P equals one. So each time you see you get as many equations, as many particles you have, and this should allow you to uh, obtain the discrete spectrum which will match uh, the spectrum of your Hamilton. So we will find P and Q from this set of equations where S is given uh, by this expression. So now if we move on uh, to the case of three and more particles, uh, in general, the situation could become quite uh, complicated because in addition to the scattering between two, uh, particles, you can also have three body scattering, say the third particle has momentum k, and so on. And so at the end of the day, your wave function will be a uh, complete mess. However, the miracle of integrability implies that you can uh, ignore almost entirely uh, the three uh, particle scattering and just hope for the best and write your wave function in the most naive possible way. Uh, so you write psi of P I, your set of particles is now you have several N's and M and you have I by 
1 and 1 plus dot 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 plus i pm and m and then you also have a sum over all permutations of momenta p1 to p n and each time you make uh, an elementary permutation you have to add a factor of s so p1 p2 and so on. all right so this is uh, roughly how it looks like uh, this is what is known as coordinate bit on that so we have spins now um, at all these positions a man turned down yeah. so uh, but at the end of the day we want uh, the analog of this equations which will give us a spectrum right spectrum of uh, first momenta which then we can uh, transfer into a spectrum of energies so and for that uh, we can again use this picture that we have um, particles now and very simply each time we take our particle and move it around we have to take into account a free motion along the chain and then uh, for each other particle we cross say p2 pm we have to introduce uh, the phase additional phase factor p2 as p pm and set this to one all right and this will be for your p1 that's equation for p1 and then you get in, in total m such equations you find uh, the set of momenta and then the energy's eigenstate of your Hamiltonian will be given just by the sum of all uh, 2 minus 2 cosine p i all right up to some factor which we'll fix later <clears throat> okay so we are almost done uh, with the spectrum uh, let me just introduce a more convenient uh, parameterization so instead of uh, the physically meaningful momentum uh, it's frequently useful to introduce uh, this rapidity ui or spectral parameter as well uh, and in this parameterization our previous formula for the uh, scattering matrix s scattering phase in this case uh, becomes just a rational function and that's the main purpose of introducing this ui at this point and uh, then the rules of the game are um, the periodicity condition is in this uh, new coordinates is formulated in this way uh, so you solve this m equations you find a set of uk and we will consider uh, some cases where this can be done analytically and after that number one number two you find spectrum by using this equation all right so now uh, let's uh, jump to mathematic and uh, verify some of our claims which i left so far without derivation but you are more than welcome to check them by hand i will switch now to mathematica in case you haven't seen uh, this before, uh, I advise you to watch the supplementary video, which will allow you to uh, have a quick start. Uh, so what I'm going to do uh, in this uh, part of the lecture is to represent uh, the Heisenberg uh, Hamiltonian uh, in Mathematica, then study its spectrum uh, for short chains, and then we also we derive the main steps in the lecture, such as S matrix dispersion relation, and make some comparison with the bit on those. So to begin with, we have to decide how to represent our states. And uh, I mean, it's quite convenient. Uh, there is this function 
Catam and Mathematica, which doesn't do uh, anything, actually just uh, gives this nice output when you press Shift Enter. This is what it gives. So it doesn't really do any calculation for you. So I will define now the permutation operator. So uh, the permutation operator will have two indices A and B. Uh, and it will first I define a section on the pure state on the just cat without any coefficient. Um, and this three uh, double underscore, what it means, uh, it, it means that it could be any expression of uh, separated by commas, whereas uh, one underscore is actually uh, just one argument. Um, and then having defined this pattern in the left hand side, I can do some transformation in the right hand side. And I'm going to replace part, that's the function, uh, which basically does the permutation that's already existing in Mathematica. All right, so element number A, I'm saying here, uh, is going to the element of the list C, number B, and the element B is going to the element uh, of the list C, which contains all the arguments of this cat. Um, and that's how the permutation works. So let's give it a try. Uh, say one, two, and let's act on some cat, zero, one, zero, one. Right, actually, so previously I wrote two, it's, it's not a legal state in our Hilbert space, but if you were studying SU3 spin chain, this would be totally allowed. So you see, I did so I can actually put here 11, 12, just to confuse you a bit, and it will interchange 11 and 12. However, we are not done yet because I also want the permutation operator to work in the situation when the pure state is multiplied by some scalar coefficient, and at the moment it doesn't do anything, right? For us. So we have to define a special rule for this case. I just repeat the same, say D times cat C, and this should be just P, and then permutation AB cat C. So now when I uh, press shift enter, Mathematica knows about this new rule, and now you see it does perform uh, permutation even in this case. And then finally what is missing is when I have, say, two such states, one, let's say the proper one. Then again, of course, uh, our operator doesn't know how to act on the sum of two. So I have to specially define it by hand. And after that, we should be ready to use it to define the Hamiltonian. Right. So you can see now it works nicely. So did indeed interchange independently, 0, 1, 11, and 12, and gave us a result. Now we are ready to define the Hamiltonian. I introduce uh, some finite length, say 4, and then the Hamiltonian will be acting on some state, and then we have a sum of the density uh, of the Hamiltonian, and then we have to treat separately the rust, a last element and perform the permutation uh, there. So the last element I just treat by hand, so it's not the best example of programming, but it does work. All right, so this is our Hamiltonian, it's just a sum of permutations the way we defined it initially. So of course, I can, I should probably introduce this to G square coefficient. Uh, be consistent with my initial notations. Just three by hand. It's not be consistent with my initial notations. So this is our number. So small mistake I've noticed actually index i should start from one. So it's not Python, it is mathematical, so everything is more human like. Um now let's give it a try. Let's act it uh with this Hamiltonian some state with one magnum and see what it gives. So next I will define uh, the wave function of one magnum and for that we need 
um, uh, it's a helper function which will produce uh, one arrow down in this case in the any location below. So I prepared this function just to explain uh, what's going on. Um, you see this bully function will be one or zero depending on whether expression is true or false. So in this case, if I put this, this will create me this list. So at the end, you see it creates a list, uh, not the cat. So in order to fix that, I have to replace the header. And this is done with this double add symbol. So this will convert list into the cat. And after that, I just arrange this into this function. So now we are ready to define our sign. So I just multiply this by the plane wave sum and to L, and this will be our sign. Okay, next we will plug it into the eigenvalue equation uh, and see which condition P should satisfy. So first, you see, we have to work a bit on this expression to make it uh, nicer. So I want to collect with all the terms with the same cap state. That's how it is done. I can simplify each term in front of each cat like that. And uh, now we can take the first term in this expression and set it to zero. And I solve for lambda for the eigenvalue. Right, if I also simplify a little bit, I get the wrong result. Right, so the reason I got this um, seemingly uh, wrong result, because uh, what we're expecting is to minus cosine p, is that uh, I took a very specific term. The first term is actually uh, when Magnus hit it down. So let's try with the second term, and you see uh, now it works nicer. So we will actually come back to that. Uh, so let me put last to get rid of this. Uh, brackets around and uh, this will be my dispersion e not for example of all right so now uh, presumably if i copy this equation and instead of lambda insert e not of p i should get zero so however you see indeed there is some mismatch exactly at the terms when the magnus is at the beginning or at the end. However, we also see that actually these both terms are proportional to the periodicity uh, condition. Remember, we wrote before EPL should be equal to one uh, in order to ensure uh, that the wave function is periodic. And this uh, is how it actually manifests itself this requirement in the actual calculation. So the terms when the magnum is at the end uh, will not satisfy immediate lag in value problem unless you impose in addition the periodicity uh, of the uh, momentum of the wave. All right, so now let's uh, look at the two magnum situation and uh, derive the S matrix. So I um, already uh, defined this function with two magnum, the way it works is again uh, that it inserts to magnets at position one and two or one and three and depending on this and one and two and the way I defined is exactly equivalent to the previous one magnet case I just inserted or uh, into this bully function so it creates two uh, ones uh, in the position and one and then two um, and now I can also copy essentially my plane wave and adapt it for the case of two magnets and one and two and one and the sum for in two in order to avoid double counting should go from n one plus one. And now I need two momenta for both magnets. And as we uh, discussed before, in addition to the plane wave, I also need an S matrix, the scattering of two magnets against each other. And this will come with the, the same factor where uh, P and Q are interchange, or equivalent in one and N two. 
All right, so now again, I can act uh, on this wave function. And this time I already know the eigenvalues. It will be just a sum of two plane waves because it uh, is just the uh, free motion of two magnets. So the energy is linked uh, to the momentum uh, by the standard dispersion, which we did used in one magnet case already. So plugging this into the eigenvalue equation, that's what we get. Uh, again, let's massage it a bit. So cat and gets collected together. And maybe we need to full simplify because just simplify is not necessary enough. And that's what we get, right? So which uh, one should we take? Uh, so this one again, so let's avoid the situation when either of the magnets is at the boundary. Um, so I just want to take the coefficient of this expression uh, for the two magnet state where they are the position two and three, right? So, and this gives me uh, an equation for the S matrix. So I say equals zero and solve for S. So feel free to pause this video of course I'm uh, doing this uh, really quickly, uh, but do it at your pace if you need it. So that is our S matrix and let's again get rid of the um, curly brackets around and define S not as not as being our uh, S matrix. And so what's next? I uh, uh, leave you as an exercise the following. Um, please check that once you plug into our eigenvalue uh, problem, uh, as to be this uh, particular value, and also find two equations on P and Q, you will be able to satisfy all these equations. And you see, so there are uh, quite a few equations, more than three, definitely. And you only have three parameters S, P and Q to satisfy them. So uh, this is a non-trivial uh, that this at the end will work. So instead, now I will uh, continue with something else. I will uh, now represent uh, Hamiltonian as a matrix. So it will be two to the L uh, size matrix. And now uh, we will build it. So in order to build um, uh, two to the L, and so to the size matrix, I have to list explicitly all the states the way we are doing it now. So this is a function and I leave it as an exercise for you to understand of what is going on here. So you can always um, check in help system or by type equation mark sequence. For example, if you're not sure what um, this function does or um, Platon, for example, is another one, which could be new. Oops, if you spell it properly, it gives you some hint, and then you can click uh, for example, to see some examples in the help system. Um, so that's a simple function to generate your all states, probably not the best ever implementation. Um, and now what I want to do, I want to act with my Hamiltonian on all of the states. So another bit of uh, mathematical synthesis for, for you, if you want to act by some function on a list of numbers, so that f acts on each element, you use a slash add. So that's exactly what we want. We want to act with our Hamiltonian on the list of all states. So I create as a linear combination of new states, and then I want to extract this combination. So with a coefficient, efficient state uh, where state will iterate through all states and this is another usage of table you can actually in your iterator iterate uh, not just from zero to five but uh, through any list of objects so and that's the matrix which you obtain uh, so one thing you actually have to transpose it to but in this case doesn't matter so this is HM as a matrix, and now we can find all the eigenvalues 
Actually, what are the lengths? Length is five currently. Right? This, uh, so you will probably, so I, in the meantime, I changed uh, four to five. That's why I get this huge matrix. Um, but you may need to change it and run through all the steps again. Make sure everything is updated. Right, so now let's compute eigenvalues. Eigenvalues. Uh, let's misspell it. And that's what we get for the case of the lens 5. So that's the complete spectrum. Um, and you see some states actually appears twice. Maybe I factor to make them look more uh, similar. And then to see the degeneracy of the state, that's a nice function to use. It just uh, find element and how many times it appears in the list. So we, we see this state is with this energy degenerate four times, this one, two times, and so on. So the goal uh, for the uh, for the rest of this block is to reproduce these numbers uh, with bit and dots. Right now. In order to reproduce the spectrum with bit and dots, I already uh, predefined this equation. As uh, you recognize the bit and dots equation, which we discussed in the lecture. So now, if I have, say, a length 5, 1 magnon, and k will correspond to the index, to the number of the equation, which in this case can only be 1, I get this equation. It's a nice polynomial equation. And we can just solve it. Uh, and actually, I don't need to say what for. And that gives me a list of solutions. And what we need is the energy at the end. So I just plug it into the expression for the dispersion. And this probably misses to g square, I guess. And if we simplify it a little bit. Uh, Hopefully that's what we find. Uh, let's also group the solutions together. So it's similar and we can compare. So you see we reproduced two out of eight um, solutions here. And as well as this one is also appeared with degeneracy eight and we only have two. But because we only considered one magnet sector, right? So there is still a long way to go. Um, because now I can also solve x5, 2 to refer to the number of magnets. And I have two equations now for each of them. Right? So that's what I find. Oops, it's a bit horrible looking. And let's uh, look at uh, what we've got. So full simplifying always helps uh, if you are patient enough um, to wait. So there are some solutions which actually we don't like. For example, this solution we don't like, or this solution we don't like. So what is wrong about them is that the beta roots are equal for these solutions. And if beta roots are equal, remember that UK is related to the momentum. So if we go back and, and look at the wave function, uh, what it will mean, it will mean that these two exponents are equal. Uh, however, at the same time, S, which we found here, uh, you can plug uh, here P equal Q and you get minus one. So actually the wave function is identically zero. So even though we found the solution for the beta and the equation, it doesn't make sense because all, um, all wave functions corresponding to equal roots have to uh, be dropped. Furthermore, we shouldn't distinguish solution which only uh, differ by the order uh, uh, order of u1, u2. So for us, it's an order set uh, and all roots should be different. So we need some filtering to be done to the solutions. Uh, so let me guide through some steps. So first, instead of uh, this format, of solve, which gives the substitute. I made a table uh, so that this u1, this is u2, and each uh, line corresponds to one solution. 
So next I applied sort, which will order uh, routes you want and you two. So for example, uh, this now two lines are identical just because before they were different only by the ordering of U1 and U2. So next I apply union. Union just removes the uh, duplicates. And after that, I have to remove uh, uh, finally these solutions where uh, two roots coincide. So this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, all of them should go. Um, sorry if it's blinking because this is some side effect of me clicking on equations. I'm still to, to find how to fix it. And at the end, what I do, I do select. Uh, and select is a nice function. You can uh, specify any criteria. So in this case, I say if a first element is not equal to the second, then select it. And that gives me a list of five uh, independent solutions. So and after that, we uh, can plug those solutions uh, into our dispersion relation. And uh, we can verify that indeed this gives us a bit more of those energies, which we found from direct diagonalization procedure. Right? So we reproduce, I think, this one and this one this time. So we are done with this part uh, for today. Just to summarize some exercises for you first, uh, of course, try to reproduce the code above, uh, understand all the syntax features of Mathematica and read help about all unknown uh, to you functions, if there are any, of course. Uh, then repeat the calculation we've done above for land six case, and also try to reproduce um, this energies with uh, B times that's equations, and you may also need to include three magnum uh, solution. All right, and now I will switch back and we continue with integrability of the hydrogen spin chain. All right, so in this part of the lecture, we discuss integrability finally of the uh, Heidelberg spin chain. And we begin by introducing the Jan Baxter equation. The best way to introduce the Jan Baxter equation is by making the following diagram. So we have three oriented lines, and uh, this is left hand side of our equation. And for the right hand side, we just take one of these lines and move it to the left. So what we obtain in this way is keeping the orientation uh, unchanged. All right. So now in practice, what it means is that each of these vertices is a tensor or R matrix, and it has four incoming, A, B, and two outgoing indices. And furthermore, it is a function of two variables, <coughs> U and V. Right, so how um, do we convert this diagram into the equation on R? So uh, each of these R's corresponds uh, to the um, intersection of two of these lines. So AB corresponds to in going and CD to outgoing indices. And these two variables, they are touched to each of the lines. So U is attached to the first one and V to the second one, right? So the way we uh, look at that, we have to take all uh, two incoming lines and uh, go clockwise uh, to write indices A, B and keep indices U and V in the same order. And then you see A becomes C, A becomes C, and B becomes D. So B will go to D. So in order to convert uh, this young Baxter equation into a more explicit expression in terms of R's, I have to add external indices A, B, C, D, E, F, and the same indices in the right hand side. C, 
D, D, E, F. And we also need some summation indices in between. So to distinguish, let's use Greek letters. And now it doesn't matter how you assign them. So external indices have to be synchronized. Furthermore, um, I now have to introduce the spectral parameter attached to each line. So I will introduce U for this line, W for this line, and V for this line, for example. And again, in the right picture, um, that I should assign the spectral parameters in the same way. So vertical line will still have W, line going to the right will still keep U. All right, and now uh, if you look, for example, on this vertex, we can immediately recognize that uh, this is nothing but R. And now again, so the rule of the game is you have to uh, find all incoming indices, this two, and write them in the right order. So it will be A, F. Then I use the same order of for the arguments, U and V. And then A become gamma. So I write gamma on top of A and F become alpha, right? In the same way, uh, we can also write down this vertex. So you see the in incoming lines are alpha indices, alpha and beta. So, and I have to go clockwise when writing them. So it's B alpha. And then B is going into beta, alpha is going into C. And then also the order of the spectral parameter uh, should follow the indices. So B is W and alpha is attached to V. So in this way we get this one and finally you can check I didn't make a mistake when writing the third one and similar for the right hand side you get a similar expression. So this is what is known under it goes under the name of Young Baxter equation. So now let's explain why that equation is important. Um, so we can now start using uh, these diagrams uh, to build uh, some bigger objects. And for example, let me build the following object. Right. So it is a collection of how many five of our matrices connected in a certain way. And then this line uh, normally is referred to as an auxiliary space. And this collection of five lines, uh, you can think about them as acting on the physical space of two uh, to the L uh, dimensional linear space. And that's our Hilbert space of the spin chain. It's known as physical space. So AB, and this we will denote as TAB of U, because each of the lines should have a spectral parameter. And for simplicity, uh, you can introduce U for this line. And in the simplest case, but it generalizes further, you can put zero spectral parameter to all the vertical lines. So, and that defines you uh, this object TAB of U, um, which for each value of index A and B gives an operator acting on the Hilbert space, um, similarly how the Hamiltonian is acting on the physical space. Uh, before. So for each uh, value of u, you get an operator acting on the physical space. So we call this set of uh, operators as uh, monodromy matrix. So another important object is a trace um, of this uh, operator. Trace 
in the auxiliary space and we denoted small t. So in our case, it was a a of u. And this we will call transfer matrix. Well, you can also make it into a picture. Oh, look like that. So itself, it looks already like a spin chain, even though there is no connection yet. So what are we going to show? We want to show that this t of u and if it is a function of u, it is commuting with itself for any values of its argument. And uh, the way we are going to do that, we will use this identity. All right, so why is that important? Because this will imply that any coefficient in the expansion of this function with respect to the parameter u will give us a commuting operator on the physical space. And then if you also manage to show, show that Hamiltonian is a part of this family of commuting operators, then we are done. So next, consider the following diagram. Um, so now I have two uh, horizontal lines. And uh, of course, you recognize this is nothing but a product of two operators T, A, B. So this is T, C, D of U times T, A, B of V. All right, so it's, uh, we are getting close uh, to this commutator, and then we need to take trace uh, in, in this uh, C and D and A and B and show that this is the same as if we interchange these two lines. So how can we interchange these two lines? So the trick is the following. I attach at the end of this diagram uh, another uh, crossing, another R matrix of uh, if you look at that so there are two lines which are in coming this way so it will be r of v comma u All right so this is nothing but the product of uh, tt and then um, some of the synthesis b and d are contracted with r so it will be uh, r will receive two indices and in the order B, D, and then create new indices E, F. So E is a continuation of B and F is here. All right, so now uh, in this form, we can uh, finally use our equation, which tells us that you can take a line uh, to the left from the crossing and move it uh, to the right as simple as that so if we move this line to the left we can uh, do it one by one and at the end of the day uh, we end up with a diagram where this vertex r is moved to the left and instead of this we get something more like that so that's the equation we get that uh, so, which you see is almost perfect because if initially we have uh, T with the spectral parameter V next to the physical space, uh, now it is moved on top. So indeed the order interchange and we almost got the commutator which we uh, initially wanted to get. The only problem is uh, that we need to, oops, we need to get rid of R here and there and take threads. So that's not a problem because I can just uh, schematically write T, T, R times R minus one, put this under the trace. And this will be the trace in the indices uh, A, B, and C, and D. And then if I use my identity, I can move T, uh, R to the left. And let's keep also track of the 
uh, spectral parameter. So this is T of U, this is T of V, and here they are interchanged. And uh, finally, final step, uh, under the trace, I can use cyclicity and cancel these R's. So what I guess get is a trace, which is a trace in indices A and C. Uh, so I get a sum in A, sum in C, and T, capital T of U, A, A, capital T of C, C, and then this is of course just T of U times T of V. And for the right hand side, you get T of V, T of U. So indeed, these T's, they contain a family of commuting operators. Of course, the question is now whether this family is anyhow interesting, and in particular, whether it uh, contains our initial Hamiltonian. So before we uh, answer this question, we need to actually solve the Jan Baxter equation. Um, so it's not too complicated in this particular case uh, when we have SU2 symmetry, but we can also consider a more general case of SUN symmetry. So when we have SUN symmetry, uh, what we can do, we can look at the invariant tensors, which we have at hand, and uh, there are not that many. So there is the uh, epsilon Kronecker symbol, which just tells that you can build a trivial representation out of uh, fundamental and anti-fundamental. And you also have epsilon tensor with and in this which tells that you can build a trivial representation out of n fundamental representations. Um, so this is not very useful for us because there are too many indices in general for SU2. Okay, you can uh, actually use it as well. Um, so we'll just try to use the Kronecker symbol to build uh, some structures with four indices. And it's not easy, uh, hard to see that A, uh, B, C, D, U, and V. So there are only two structures which you can build. So either you pair A and C um, together, or you pair A and D together with the Kronecker symbol. So literally there are only two structures. And for each of them, I can write some scalar coefficient a c d e plus h delta a d b c all right so one uh, thing to notice though that um, overall factor say h i can divide or multiply by h r and then it will uh, disappear from this equation, right? Because you see uh, there is always the same order of indices on the right hand side. And uh, basically we can cancel H by rescaling your R. So for in my conventions, I just set H to one and that's the most general structure you can write. So after that, uh, it's quite straightforward. You just have to plug uh, this expression into uh, the unbutter equation. And uh, what you obtain is the following. All right, so I leave this as an exercise for you to plug it and uh, do the trivial Kronecker algebra. Um, so in the equation you obtain is some structure of delta still staying in front, but uh, the most important uh, is the dynamical um, factor is this one. So this is the equation for G, which we are trying to solve. Um, 
So the way we saw it, uh, we just use that actually U, V, and W are completely arbitrary. So what I can do, I can take derivative with respect to say du and dv. So if I do that, it's obvious that this term disappears, this term disappears because it doesn't depend on v, it doesn't depend on u. And what I get is that du dv g u e is zero. Right, and this is a uh, more the, 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 the standard um, two-dimensional uh, wave equation. Everyone knows that the general solution is a function uh, moving in one direction plus, let's say it's F1, F2 going in the in other di directions in light concordance. So we reduced uh, uh, the problem is just to two scalar functions. And now uh, if you plug this here, you will see that because of this minus, there will be some cancellations. And at the end, you will find f of u minus f2 of u equals zero plus. So you conclude that f one is minus f two of u. So there is one single function, and we conclude that g of u v is simply f of u minus f of v. Right, and finally, uh, we notice that actually. Uh, the meaning of u and v is a spectral parameter wouldn't change uh, if we replace u by any function. Of u, right? So far, u was just some parameter attached to the line. So if we replace it by uh, some function of this parameter, nothing in the above consideration will change. So just to say that there is a, uh, mm, uh, that uh, without any loss of generality, uh, you can uh, set f of u to u. And then uh, g will be simply a difference u and, um, between u and v. The next question we have to answer is whether t, uh, which is now very explicit, not very, but a little bit more explicit than before, uh, is given by this, and then you take trace. And now each of this vertex, we know what it is exactly. And we determine that R is U essentially times identity um, plus a permutation operator. Uh, whether this T of U contains the Hamiltonian. <clears throat> so to answer this question, let, uh, equation, let's look at some uh, particular value of u. So more precisely, if we take u to be zero, then that's an obvious simplification that r becomes simply a permutation, which means that in that the general crossing, you get more specifically this line going to the left and this line going up. Right, so then it's very easy to see that if we take our general t of u and set u to zero, then uh, there will be changes that this line will just connect here, this line connect here, this line like that. So what uh, type of operator we get? We get an operator that just shift uh, your spin by one side from the left to the right because we also have trace, so this line goes here because we are under the trace. So this is a shift operator. So we conclude that T of zero is nothing but the shift operator. So then uh, what's next? Let's uh, try to expand around the special point, U equals zero. 
more precisely, if I take derivative t prime of u and set u to zero. So what will happen in this case? Uh, so we are now allowed to keep one uh, power of u somewhere. So it, uh, some side, one side uh, will replace the permutation operator by identity. This way we'll get the linear in u term. So let's say that's our first side, uh, which contains identity instead of permutations, and we get this line going straight, and this line will go through and jump there. Or we can also have identity operator sitting at the second side, and then this line will uh, go through, and this line will go straight up. So let's look at this term, uh, it's a bit easier. So what I will get is this line is going just straight and this line goes through, then I continue shifting it to the right. Cool. Uh, so you see most of this operator is again just the shift. So why don't we just uh, multiply it by an inverse shift operator. So what is the inverse shift operator? Just I connect it to, oops, to this um, diagram. So this goes here and finally, Finally, what this uh, is the same as this point, so I don't need to attach anything else. <clears throat> All right, so now if we just uh, streamline this a little bit, uh, because at the moment, let me copy it. Oops, copy. So now let's just massage it a little bit. So this line is just going straight up. This line as well, it's going up. Then this line doesn't go up, and this line goes to the right. And again, um, something weird is going on with this line, but if you fix it, it should also go straight up. Right, I screwed up a little bit here. So this, um, anyway, so what we see here is uh, just the permutation between side two and three. And then uh, you can guess that if you now keep another side, uh, linear term in another side, you will get permutation between three and four and so on. And so indeed, at the end you get that um, t of zero divided by t of u and uh, t of zero is just a sum over all permutations. So, and this is a, almost exactly our Hamiltonian up to the constant shift, which of course identity operator commutes with anything. And, uh, uh, multiplication by our 2g, so we conclude that h is 2g square, then identity times l minus uh, du log d of u, then you set u to zero. So indeed, uh, u is one uh, of those operators in this family of commuting operators. And furthermore, H now will commute with any T of V, or V is a complex number. Right, the next thing we'll discuss is the uh, uh, algebraic bit on that. And this not to be confused with the beta and that equations, which we discussed previously. Remember that the set of equations for the beta roots uk, from which you can find uh, the eigenvalue of your 
uh, Hamiltonian. So as opposed to this, uh, algebraic Bethan uh, is a construction for the wave function, uh, which diagonalizes in particular the Hamiltonian, but at the same time, also all other uh, integrals of motion, which are hidden in the monodromy matrix. Right, and uh, these two constructions are uh, related to each other, and uh, for that, to see this relation in a clear way, we have to change a bit our conventions for the R uh, matrix. I have to introduce U plus I over two by shifting U to U plus I over two uh, times identity minus I permutation. So I also need to rescale my R a little bit. Uh, it's not really necessary, but you can always do that. So this is just simply new convention. Which would give us an immediate link with the previous um, uh, uh, bit the equations. So now you see to get Hamiltonian, you have to evaluate not the or at the origin, but rather at uh, minus i over two, right? Because the idea was to kill this term uh, in most cases and then just get permutation, um, as we discussed before. So now, uh, what are the construction? First, we need to introduce notations. Uh, remember that T was a trace, T A A, of the uh, monodromy matrix. And since in our case, it's just two by two matrix, where each entry is an operator acting on our spin chain. Uh, normally, one introduces the specific name uh, for the elements of this matrix, so A, B, and so on. So in particular, T, the operator we want to diagonalize is simply A plus D of Q. All right, and then the construction is very simple to tell this answer, but a bit harder to derive. And this will be your exercise, which I will uh, make uh, step by step as much as possible is the following that you have to act with the operator B evaluated exactly at the beta roots, for which you would find from this equation. It's quite uh, magical the way it works. And you act on the vacuum, which is just empty state without magnets, with all spin ups. So basically, each B creates for you one magnet. So it is, in a sense, a creation operator. So let me give you some hint on uh, how to prove that. Uh, so obviously, in order to prove that, you should be able to act with operator T, which is a combination of A and D. Um, so A. B, 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 it comes and you should be able to uh, simplify. So first you can notice that when A acts on the vacuum, it gives something very simple just because it's all spin ups. Um, so there is not much left uh, in the transfer matrix when it acts on the state. So this is first step, understand how A D acts on the vacuum. Uh, so second, we will also need to know how to commute operators, uh, how to move them around. We have A of U, B of B, then how to move them around. And uh, there are uh, relations which allows you to do that. And actually that's something we already discussed. Because if you remember, we had this diagram at some point. Okay. Better to draw it from another side. So this diagram, uh, which is uh, also called RTT or TTR equal to RTT. 
So uh, it had four free indices. And so in principle, it will give you uh, 16 relations between matrix elements of T, which are A, B, C, D. So that's exactly the type of relations you will need to uh, show this identity, show that this is the eigenfunction of this operator. Right, and furthermore, these identities are quite important. They encode uh, for, uh, for us something which is known as Yangian um, of the SU2 group. So it is a quantum uh, extension, generalization of just uh, SU2 algebra, which contains it as a sub uh, algebra. All right, so we are ready for the final part of this lecture. It's about ADSFT applications of uh, the integrability methods, which we just discussed. <clears throat> so first, uh, I'm sure there will be uh, more uh, on ADSFT correspondence, so I will just go through that briefly. And I will be speaking mostly about, uh, only about N equals four superring mills uh, in 4D which uh, is dual to a uh, to a string in ads5 cross s5 so the way it works is the following so at one hand we have the uh, gauge theory lagrangian which is like uh, one quarter F mini square plus uh, some fermionic fields, and then what will be important for us six scalar fields, so six real uh, scalars. And there are uh, some interactions between them. Uh, and uh, you know, you, you may know that you can obtain this Lagrangian as a result of reduction that's the best uh, way of doing that uh, from uh, 10 dimensions of n equals 1 n equals 1 um so mills <clears throat> so we have this uh, six scalar fields and now uh how does integrability come into the uh, game uh, this historically comes by go back uh, to the work of minahan and the Rambo. And what they've done, they actually have done better than uh, what I'm going to describe. Uh, they considered a particular class of operators, trace of x, z, x, z, so that in total there are L operators and m, m axis, uh, where x and Z, so you can define them in terms of the real scalar. So those are just complex combinations of the <clears throat> scalars. So anyway, so the point is that you can identify uh, those operators with uh, spin chain states. Just uh, say that X is spin down, Z is spin up. And that's how this relation works. So now, of course, you can ask uh, uh, what does it have to do with spin chains in the sense that you also need to get the Hamiltonian from somewhere. The Hamiltonian appears once we start computing um, computing uh, two-point correlation functions of this operator, so one operator of this type, and you understand there are many operators sitting at X and another operator uh, con complex conjugate sitting at Y. <clears throat> so, and once you start doing that, uh, uh, you will find out that in the planar limit, when N goes to infinity, there are not so many graphs you can draw, right? So you have one operator sitting at one point, 
another details here. So some of these dots are X's, some of these dots are Z's. So let's maybe use different colors. Some are X's, some are Z's. And um, then most of the time, so the propagator between X and Z is zero, right? So it's a bit unfortunate. Um, let's change the color a bit like that. So most of the time, if you're at one loop level, you would just connect uh, directly some of this. And uh, then you can allow for yourself for just one um, extra move. So for example, you can have at one loop because each works uh, costs you a lambda that of coupling. You can allow for one uh, intersection between these lines. And this already is very reminiscent of the Heisenberg spin chain Hamiltonian, where I remember our Hamiltonian was just a sum of our permutations. So this is how this Hamiltonian appears uh, from the perturbation theory directly in a four dimensional gauge theory. So more precisely, Hamiltonian is related to the mixing matrix. And uh, the eigenstates are the particular combinations of these operators. This uh, will be the uh, CFT primary. Right, so safety primaries are particular combinations of uh, those operators, which satisfy the property that when you compute the two-point function, it scales as uh, one over x minus y to the power delta. Because if you take two randomly selected operators, this wouldn't be true. So that's uh, uh, where, how integrability appears at this uh, at the field theory side. Now let's uh, discuss uh, briefly the string theory side. So string theory, uh, so I, I mentioned already, the important parameter is lambda, the top coupling. In string theory, this parameter also appears uh, in the following way. So first, what is the string theory about? Maybe, um, so we have a string in ADS5 crosses 5. Uh, let's try to draw it. So we have little string sitting there. <clears throat> and uh, the worksheet action or um, Lagrangian, you can write it as square root of lambda and then integral d mu x d mu x where x um, uh, coordinates on this uh, curved space. So lambda appears here in front of the action uh, and uh, in order to understand how the duality works in this particular setup if you where we consider only operators of this type is equivalent to considering a subspace uh, where instead of ADS5, you just have R and S5 reduces to S3. Right? So it's a subspace of the whole space. So this is a consistent truncation, uh, so called. And then you can be more specific and write Lagrangian as an integral. Uh, over x naught will be coordinate on r and then we also have um, four coordinates on s3 let's call them xi or i goes from one to three, uh, but 
In addition, uh, we have to impose that uh, uh, Xi is accordion from the sphere, so there is an additional Lagrange multiplier lambda, uh, which imposes a constraint X square equals one. So let me go through the key equations at the string side. So this is the action, which now I wrote with all coefficients, uh, hopefully correct. Um, then next, you can always choose a, a temporal gauge so that X naught is actually proportional to your uh, worksheet time. Uh, then you can see the section is already written in the conformal gauge where the metric is uh, basically set to the diagonal, to the, uh, uh, to the flat one. Uh, and as a result, you will get uh, still, yeah, you still have to take into account the equation of motion for the metric, which uh, takes this form. That's uh, after you plug this particular form of X naught and just the usual Grassoro constraint. And uh, then you have to derive equations of motion for Xi, and due to this uh, Lagrange multiplier, there will be uh, not. Uh, just Laplace x equals zero as in the flat space, but there will be a non-linear part. So, well, these equations uh, as a classical equations are also integrable, um, but uh, we will not go uh, into uh, the discussion. Let me just uh, finally tell you what is the analog of this energy of the spin chain. This is the delta uh, which corresponds uh, to the symmetry of the worksheet um, of the translation uh, along x not coordinate, not to the worksheet. target space, uh, usual target space energy. Uh, so you can derive it from the section just by applying the Noether uh, theorem, uh, and you will find uh, that it is just proportional to kappa, but kappa from the Rasoro condition is just the square root. So, I mean, these are quite uh, standard uh, things, except for uh, this nonlinearity, which is coming through uh, this constraint that we are now on a sphere. Otherwise, it's absolutely standard uh, string theory. Uh, then, what uh, the problem you will be asked to do, so it's uh, quite um, well uh, written, I hope, a step by step exercise is to find some particular type of solution on uh, S3. So we have S3 and we still have uh, non-trivial Xi's as a function of tau and sigma. Uh, so there will be a particular class of solution, which is called the circular string. And for this solution, you can easily find delta and, uh, and that's the uh, first part of the exercise. And it is uh, given by J, the angular momenta, and then it goes like the following. If you expand in large J. Yeah, and so what is interesting in the calculation, you'll find some non-trivial coefficient here. Or maybe I should call it beta. And then at the same time, by solving the beta and thus equations, uh, you, you will study a particular class of solutions, for the beta and thus equation. And then you should be able to uh, get some kind of match. So I will. Uh, leave it to you uh, to check and uh, the details are given in the exercise and I hope you will enjoy. All right, uh, so uh, at this point I just stop and uh, I will see you uh, after you've done with your exercises. Uh, so please prepare questions and uh, I will prepare solutions. Hopefully, we'll be able to solve all these problems myself. Okay, thank you.